Hello everyone. My name is Ajwal Gandhi and I'm the founder of Spatial Dots. Today, I'm going to give you a crash course on GIS. This video is suitable for people who have never taken a formal class in GIS and want to get a quick overview of the core GIS concepts. If you do have a background in GIS, this video still might be helpful to get some clarity on concepts like projections and datums. And I also share some practical tips on what projection to use for different types of data sets. So with that, let's get started. This video is divided into three parts. We'll start with a basic understanding of spatial data sets. How do we model different objects into a GIS? Then we will look at what a GIS is and what it can do. But most of the time we'll spend on understanding projections. This is arguably one of the most difficult topics in spatial data science. So I'll explain it from the very basics and give you a good practical understanding of how to apply those into your projects. So let's first understand what is spatial data. The key insight that led to the development of spatial analysis was the fact that you can combine data and location, and when you put them together, you can use that to derive a lot of useful insights. So spatial data consists of two parts. There is a geometry, points, lines, polygons, and those each geometry is also linked with some properties. And by linking those together, you are able to work with them together and do some interesting analysis. So this is an example of uh, spatial data. This is in the GeoJSON format, but the format is not important here. The idea is that for a data set to be uh, considered a spatial data, you need both a location. So here we have a point location uh, with some coordinates, and we also have some properties. We have some information about that location. Right? So location and information about the location when they're put together, that is considered as spatial data. Uh, there are different types of spatial data. Uh, let's look at some examples. Uh, we have a category of vector data, which we call vector spatial data. These are points, lines, and polygons. So for example, if you want to model a place, if you say, I want to model location of a city, or I have a sensor here, and I want to know the location of that, you can represent that using a point with uh, a point coordinates. Uh, you also have vector data in form of lines. So if you want to model a road or a track, a river, et cetera, uh, those can be modeled as a line. Similarly, we have polygons, and this can be used to model things like buildings or areas uh, or admin boundaries, et cetera. Right? So these are kind of the three main categories of vector data where we can model different objects as either points, lines, and polygons. There is a newer category of vector data called point clouds. These are dense point observations where you have both X, Y, and Z positions. Uh, these are typically resulted from LIDAR surveys or photogrammetry outputs where you have the position of each point in X, Y, and Z directions. And these are typically very dense. There are even a small region can have millions or billions of point observations. So in the specific data format and data processing techniques to represent them. So even though they are kind of points, X, Y, Z coordinates, uh, they are represented using a slightly different uh, method. And those are point clouds. Uh, then we have the category of raster data sets. The first one being photographs. So if you have a camera or a sensor on a drone or an aerial platform, and you're taking pictures of the earth, and then when you process and reference them on the surface of the earth, they turn into a raster data set that you can use for visualization and analysis. You also have a lot of gridded data sets, so grid of pixels, where you can represent different observations, uh, which are continuous. So things like elevation data sets, population data sets, et cetera, they can all be represented as grid of pixels. Uh, another type of data set is called mesh data set. These are time series data at different uh, continuous locations. Uh, typically, a lot of weather and atmospheric data is represented using the meshes. And uh, historically, uh, people used raster data to uh, manage that, but a uh, more modern way of doing this is using a mesh data type. Lastly, we have tasks. These are typically used in web services. If you want to share or publish geospatial data, you would typically chop your data into smaller tiles, and each tile is then fetched by the server depending on when the user requests it. So that is raster tile layers and vector tile layers. Uh, both are kind of similar to the raster and vector data sets, but they are kind of uh, created and shared in the tile format. 
So these are the broad categories of spatial data. Uh, modern GIS, such as QGIS, will be able to read and create all of this type of data sets. Now let's look at how each of these data types are stored. We learned that spatial data needs to store the coordinates, the geometry of the object, as well as the attributes of that together. And that means there are specific formats that we need to work with. Um, so let's say there are many text-based data formats which store the geographic information. We have on the non-spatial side, you might have heard of formats such as CSV or JSON, and they have spatial equivalence. So you can have a CSV file with latitude and longitude columns, and that can be used to represent point locations. Similarly, you have a format like GeoJSON, which is an extension of the JSON format, which uh, has standards on how you represent point lines and polygons. And there are other formats such as KML, which can also represent uh, data sets as XML. On the binary side, if you think of non-spatial data, you might have heard of things like PDF or Excel. Uh, there are equivalents on the spatial side where you have the one of the more popular data formats called shapefile, which is a binary format consists of many files, uh, which uh, there's a main file and there's a sidecar files, which all together make up the spatial data sets. Uh, you also have formats such as GeoPackage, which is the recommended format that I recommend when you want to use it with QGIS. Uh, which can represent multiple layers together into a binary format. Uh, there's also formats such as LS and LSE, which are compressed formats for storing point cloud data. Uh, for images, if you uh, have worked with images, you know about PNG and JPEG formats. On the spatial side, there are equivalents such as GeoTIFF, so a TIFF file with the geosp geospatial information becomes a GeoTIFF file. Similarly, a JPEG file with uh, georeference data becomes a JPEG 2000 file. Uh, there are also databases uh, which are widely used for storing and sharing geospatial data. Uh, most popular databases now have a spatial extension. So uh, Postgres, which is a very popular database, there's an extension called PostGIS, which now supports um, all different types of uh, spatial data, including vector and raster, which you can store and analyze in a database format. So we learned about the different types of data and the data formats. Now let's learn what is GIS. GIS stands for Geographic Information System. This is essentially the software tools that can work with spatial data. So this is the formal definition. And I generally like to think of any software or tool that can manipulate spatial data is uh, GIS. And this is what men, most people say GIS. This is what they mean. There's also an alternate definition of GIS. Uh, sometimes people uh, use GIS as an acronym for Geographic Information Science. This is kind of related, but this refers to the entire discipline of geospatial science. So when you think about the whole discipline, whole field is called geographic information science. The specific tools that you use in that discipline is a geographic information system. Right? So there's a difference between those. Sometimes uh, there's a bit of confusion around that. But when we normally talk about GIS, we are talking about the software that can work with spatial data. So what can a GIS software do? Uh, GIS software generally has many, many functions. Uh, uh, a complete GIS system like QGIS can do many, many things, including viewing of spatial data. So if you have data in a spatial format, you are able to view that, um, select features, zoom into each region, overlay different layers, and so on. You can also create spatial data. You can digitize photographs, or you can, can create lines, or you can you know, analyze and create new layers uh, of spatial data. You can create maps. So if there's a way to create a layout with all the mapping elements and create a map for print or publication. Uh, you can, of course, analyze spatial data. There are functions and tools built to analyze the spatial relationship between different layers and then you know, derive insights from it. You can also use a GIS for transforming data. Many times you have source data in a specific format that you need to read, extract, and then finally load it into a database. You can use GIS for that task as well. All right, with that background, we are ready to learn about projections. There's often a debate where uh, people say spatial is not special. Uh, there is nothing different about uh, spatial data science. It's just another discipline of information technology. And for the most part, it's true. It is a kind of specialized branch of IT where you are dealing with specialized data types. But there is one concept which requires much more deeper understanding and specialized knowledge, which makes 
uh, working with spatial data a little special. So that concept is the concept around projections. So let's uh, let's dive into this. I'll cover the concepts, and at the end of this video, you should have a good understanding of these terms. And once you understand these terms, whenever you are reading a tutorial or you're going through a process and you encounter these terms, you'll know what they mean and you can make an informed choice. So let's go through these terms. GIS deals with mapping and analyzing phenomena that is happening on Earth. That means we need to have an accurate mathematical representation of the Earth's surface to be able to analyze this data in a computer system. So how do we model the Earth's surface? One way is to assume the Earth is a perfect sphere and then can have mathematical representation of it. This is a pretty good approximation. Humans have known for many, many uh, centuries that Earth is a sphere and we had uh, some approximations of the Earth's surface. Currently, the best estimate of the Earth radius is 6371 kilometers. And if you have a sphere of that size, you can use it to map phenomena on Earth. Uh, while this is great, this is not completely true. We now have GPS satellites, and we have very, very accurate observations. We know that Earth is not a perfect sphere. Uh, the actual shape of the Earth closely resembles a uh, ellipsoid. That means that is it's a little bit flatter at the poles than at the equator. So we need uh, two radiuses, one uh, at the equator, one at the poles. And once we have an ellipsoid, that is a more accurate representation of Earth. The currently the best model of ellipsoid that we have is uh, having uh, an ellipsoid with the uh, semi-major axis with 6378.137 kilometers and the semi-minor axis, which is a little bit shorter than that. And now this is the most accurate uh, representation of the Earth's surface as an ellipsoid. But this requires a lot of more complex mathematical calculations to be able to do things like distance computation, etc. We know that Earth is not a perfect ellipsoid either. There are local variations and undulations. Historically, people have used mean sea level as a reference for having a surface of the Earth, which is as a zero potential. Uh, the more modern way to measure this is using gravity, where we can take gravity observations and find out the surface of gravity where there is equal gravity uh, throughout the surface. And that shape is known as a geoid. Uh, with we have very accurate measurements now, which have uh, the body which we have modeled the surface of the Earth using the geoid surface, and it looks somewhat like this. So we have two representation of the Earth's surface. One is an ellipsoid, and another one is a geoid. Which one do we use? Well, it's hard to use geoid for any mathematical calculations or analysis. So we need to use an ellipsoid. But what shape, size, and orientation of ellipsoid that we use? That's where data comes into play. Uh, we can choose an ellipsoid that most closely resembles the geoid shape. So we can choose the size of the ellipsoid, the orientation of the ellipsoid that is currently the best fit to the geoid surface that we know of. And that will minimize the distortions and we can represent the Earth as a mathematical surface for analysis. So we can choose uh, ellipsoid that is the global best fit. So the Earth's center of mass is the center of the ellipsoid. And then we can uh, orient that uh, with the semi-major and semi-minor axis that is best fit to the global geoid model. And those are known as global datums. So they, they can be used for mapping global phenomena. Historically, many uh, uh, countries and regions, they had local datums. That means they would choose the ellipsoid model that is the best fit to that region which will minimize the distortions over that region. So uh, this is an example, a diagram showing that you could pick a surface on Earth and then orient your ellipsoid to have the best fit over your region. And that means the center of your ellipsoid may be away from the center of Earth's mass. And uh, while this is useful for your region, you'll have uh, larger inaccuracies outside of the region. Global datums were hard to use historically because we didn't have ways to measure coordinates globally very accurately. But now with GPS technology, it has become much easier. And most countries, most systems now use geocentric datums, which is uh, a datum where the center of the ellipsoid is, a, is at the center of the Earth of Mars, and you have a global fit of ellipsoid. But there are still systems in use which use local datum, and you uh, may encounter them when you use them in your GIS. So to help you kind of clarify uh, this difference between a geoid and ellipsoid and datums, let me give you an example. 
a few years back, I went on a hiking trip to see sunrise at this uh, beautiful place called Nandi Hills outside the city of Bangalore. And we got to witness this beautiful sunrise. And as we were you know, leaving the place, uh, I saw this sign there, which said that you are standing on this monolithic piece of rock and the current height of this place is 4851 feet and about sea level. So above MSL is about mean sea level. And that's equal to about 1478 meters. And I thought maybe this is a good teaching moment to learn about datums. Now, if I took out my GPS receiver there, stood at the same place, my GPS receiver would show me that my height is 1393 meters. Which one is right? Is the measurement about mean sea level is correct or my GPS measurement is correct? The answer is both are correct, but they are using a different point of reference. They're using different datums. The mean sea level is using geoid as a reference. So about the geoid surface, this place is 1478 meters. But if you consider the GPS ellipsoid that is being used, the WGSAT for ellipsoid that GPS system uses, from that ellipsoid, this place is 1393 meters. And this difference between those geoid and ellipsoid is called geoid separation. And at different places of the world, you'll have different uh, values. And this indicates that you know, using different datums can have different measurements. Uh, so you need to be uh, cognizant of the datum that you are using in your data set. And as GIS people, when somebody gives us uh, latitude and longitude coordinates, uh, we cannot automatically assume that we know where the place is because we need to ask this latitude and longitude are measured with reference to which data. And depending on the answer, the position might vary significantly. Uh, so one of the different kind of datums that are used, the most popular datum that is used is called WGS84. This is the datum that is used by the GPS system. So if you use your navigation or the GPS receiver, the values that you get are reference to that datum. So this is the reference ellipsoid that is currently the best fit uh, measurement that we know using all the, the satellite measurements. And this uh, ellipsoid as the center of the Earth mass as the center and has the values of the semi-major and minor axis as I showed before. So uh, most of the time when you get some coordinates, they are referenced to this WGS84 data. But there are other datum. So for example, there is an Indian datum that was used where you had a different shape of ellipsoid uh, called Everest 1956, which had uh, different values of the semi-major and semi-minor axis. The origin of that ellipsoid is not at the center of Earth's mass because it is oriented to fit the Indian subcontinent. And uh, the, if you use an old Indian maps, uh, you have to use this Indian datum as your reference to correctly orient and locate your coordinates. Once we know what datum we want to use, we can then overlay a grid of coordinates and then we can accurately locate any place on Earth. This is known as a spatial reference system and it uh, allows us to locate any place using X, Y, and Z coordinates. Uh, there are two broad type of spatial reference system. One is called a geographic coordinate system. If you ever use latitude and longitude and altitude values, those are in geographic coordinate systems. Uh, there are also other systems such as projected coordinate systems. These are planar coordinates where you have uh, X, Y, and Z coordinates. Let's understand the difference between these two. The geographic CRS uses latitude and longitude as the X and Y coordinates to locate places on the surface of the Earth. To have a geographic CRS, you need datum. What reference ellipsoid would you use? What would be the origins of your X and Y coordinates? So X coordinates, which are the longitudes, you are, by convention, you use the central meridian at Greenwich as your zero longitude. And for your Y coordinate, which is you'll use equator as the zero coordinate. You also need a unit and typically you use degrees as the unit of latitude and longitude. The most popularly used geographic CRS is called WGS84 for short. Uh, this is using the EPSG code 4326. Uh, since there are many different coordinate systems, there are codes assigned, short number codes assigned uh, that allows us to accurately pick and share those codes. Uh, EPSG stands for European Petroleum Survey Group. This is the group that initially started assigning these codes and they are widely used now. So I'll be referring to some of these EPSG numbers and this allows you to easily say, I want to set up my projection, my coordinate system to a certain 
uh, CRS, I'll just pick the number. So the code 4326 refers to the WGS84 geographic coordinate system, where you have the uh, lat long uh, values, uh, which are referenced to the WGS84 ellipsoid, and you have the central meridian uh, at Greenwich as the zero value for your x coordinate. Geographic CRSs are great at locating places on Earth. If you know the latitude, longitude, and the datum, you can actually locate any coordinate on Earth. But they are not really suited for measuring distances or angles. For example, one degree distance at equator is very different than one degree distance at a higher latitude. So if you want to measure distances, which we want to do when we are working in a GIS environment, we cannot use a geographic CRS. Similarly, a lot of the calculations that we want to perform, they are very complex and sometimes not really possible on an ellipsoidal surface. So we need to have a planar surface where we have a uniform X and Y grid where we can do our computations. And that's why we need to have a projected CRS. So a projected CRS allows us to do our computations on flat surface, and it consists of an X and Y axis and an origin and a linear unit of measure such as meters and uh, feet. So how do you create a system where you can take an ellipsoidal surface and represent that on a flat map? And this is a difficult problem because there's no accurate way of doing this. Whatever you try, you will not be able to accurately represent an ellipsoidal surface on a flat map. Uh, there are always compromises. There are different techniques. So for example, you could take uh, the ellipsoidal model, fit a cylinder across it, project the data on the cylinder and then unwrap it, it will have a flat map. Similarly, you can do this with a cone. You can have a, a paper, turn it into a cone, project whatever is there on the surface of the ellipsoid and then project it on the cone and you can unwrap it and that'll be a planar surface. Similarly, you can also have a, fit, a flat surface and uh, parallel to one of the, the surfaces of the earth and then project that data onto that. And there are kind of three main ways of taking data on the surface of a sphere or an ellipsoid and turning them into uh, a flat surface. And these are called map projections. One of the things to know is none of them uh, preserve all three. So there are three kind of parameters that you are concerned about when you are converting this data from a spherical surface to a planar surface is what is the shape of the object. If you have a square on the surface, will it still be a square? What about distance? If you have two points at a certain distance, will the distance remain the same when you project it? And the area, if the surface of the uh, two objects are the same area, will they still be the same area when you project it? And most projections are a compromise between these three parameters. There's no one projection that can preserve all of these three perfectly. But there are many projections which uh, make a good compromise and say for a small enough region, uh, you can actually accurately preserve all three within a certain tolerance. And your job as an analyst is to pick the right projection for your use case. I will give some examples of that. Um, so there is uh, projections that preserve the shape of the object accurately. So if you have a square on a north surface, it will still be a square on the planar surface. And these are known as conformal projections. They preserve angles between lines. Um, so you might have heard of projections such as Mercator projection or Lambert conformal coning. These are examples of conformal projections. There are projections which preserve the distance. They are known as equidistant projections. So if you want to measure how far a uh, 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 missile would travel from one place and you want to measure distance from one point, you can have an equidistance projection that can give you an accurate measurement of distances from a central point. Uh, azimuthal equidistance projection is an example of that. Uh, there are other projections which preserve area. If you have you know, uh, some uh, two areas which equal areas, they will still have the same area once you project them. And those are known, uh, there are some examples such as Albert's equal area or equal earth projections, which do that. Uh, there's a really fun comic, XKCD comic, that uh, kind of shows you all the different projections and you know what it might say about you. So I encourage you to click on this link and uh, check out that uh, comic. So at this point, you might be wondering, well, this is a lot of information. I learned about datums and coordinate systems and projections. What do I really use for my project? And you just say, I just need to create this map. Tell me what projection to use. 
and I'm going to now cover and give my advice on what position to use for global maps, for country level maps, or a city or region maps. For global maps, the choice is pretty clear. If you're creating a global map, I would recommend using the projection called Equal Earth. This is a relatively new projection that is uh, preserves the area of the different continents and relative sizes. And also it is much more visually pleasing than the counterparts. So if, if you're creating maps with that, your maps would look good. They'll also represent the continents at the true relative sizes. Uh, and it is also adopted by agencies like NASA. If you see a map from NASA, it'll be in this equal as projection. The next time you are creating a global map, do not choose the default projection that is in your GIS. Make sure you are choosing the equal earth projection that will result in a more accurate representation of the global data set. For country level, there are two categories. If you want to map a large region such as I want to map Africa or I want to map the continental United States, um, there are two main choices. You can choose uh, Albert's equal area projection or Lambert conformal point projections. Many country level projections are developed using these two projections. Uh, some examples are if you're mapping India, the Survey of India recommends using a Lambert conformal conic with uh, which is centered over the Indian subcontinent. And this is a recommended projection for creating maps of India. Similarly, if you are creating maps of USA, you can use an Albert's equal area conic projection, uh, which will minimize the distortions over that region. Uh, there are many uh, projections which are developed for country specific uses. Uh, these are the kind of gridded systems that are developed for using the countries. If you're mapping a country that has the system, I would recommend to use that. So for example, if you're mapping UK, you can use the British National Grid, which is the official projection for the Ordnance Survey, and it will minimize the distortions uh, for your data set that covers that region. Uh, similarly, there is a, uh, if you're mapping Australia, there is the MGA, which is the mapping grid of Australia, and you'll find the suitable projection of MGA for the region that you're trying to map. Lastly, if you are interested in analyzing data for a city and creating maps for a city or a regional level, the recommended projection to use is UTM. UTM is not a single projection, it's a set of projections for different regions. So it divides the earth into 60 different zones. They are six degree wide zones and each zone is further divided to north and south. So there are 120 different zones of the earth and you would pick the projection that is for the zone that you are trying to map. So for example, if you are trying to map the city of Bangalore in India, you would first locate which zone is the city located in. You would use a reference map and there are websites that allow you to search for a city or coordinate and will tell you that this particular city is in the UTM zone 43 north and then you would find a reference ellipsoid that you want to use and there'll be a projection defined for that ellipsoid and that UTM zone combination. And you would use that projection to map the city and you'd be assured that you'll have the least uh, distortions over that region. Uh, this is the UTM grid reference, uh, which shows you the, each six degree zones for the north and south, and you'll be able to locate and use the projections for that region. So, Final summary of the projection to use global maps, use equal earth for country or continent map. You can use the Albers equal area or Lambert conformal pony uh, projection or use the country specific grids if that's available for your region. And for city maps, use the UTM projection. So in this video, we covered the spatial data model, how to represent different types of geographic information and how to store them in different formats. We learned about GIS, what is a GIS and what it can do. And finally, we learned about coordinate reference system, including terms such as datums, ellipsoids, geoids, and projections. And we also learned about what position to use for global, regional, and local maps. Hope this video gives you a good understanding of the GIS concepts and the terminology. You are now ready to take your first steps into the world of GIS. Thank you.